but I don't have a choice. All right, so I'll try to go through these quickly just to give you an idea of the different chemical and non-chemical options we have. First off, inspections. Again, you have to do an inspection to determine the, to determine the extent of the infestation. But as I showed you before, you know, here are these graphs of the visual count versus what the interceptors are picking up. You can see the interceptors are picking up way more bed bugs than the visual inspections do. So while, we're, while we need the visual inspections, they might not be telling us the whole story. Here's that climb up interceptor. And it's made of two moats. And this only works on things that have legs, you know, four legs or five legs, whatever. But the legs have to go in the center of the moat. You have to put talcum powder around here. So the bed bugs climb up the outside which has a felt-like material on it. They reach the top, they hit the talcum powder on the plastic, and they slide down in. Do I see a hand? No. Okay. Anyway, so the, the good thing about the interceptor is, is that it, it tells you, are these bed bugs coming from the room, or are they coming from the bed? So if they're, if they're in the inner moat, you know they're coming from the bed. If they're in the outer moat, you know they're coming from somewhere inside the room. Yeah? Yeah? That can work. I mean, the only downside is, is you don't know where they're coming from. But if you want to figure out, you know, may, maybe you've treated the bed and isolated the bed completely, you think. It's, it's pest-free, um, as far as you know. Um, but if you use these, if you, but if you find a bed bug in there, you know it came from the bed, so you weren't, you weren't completely accurate. Um, but maybe they're all coming from outside, yeah. It's the, tal the talcum powder. So what, one of the downsides of that if you let that stuff get crusty and too old, then they can climb right back out. So yeah, you have to you have to keep these things clean. You have to put new talcum powder in there every few days. Yeah, it, yeah. Somehow, you know, on the plastic, it just makes things slick. They're, they're not really good at climbing up plastics and glass anyway. Oh, yeah. Actually, I, I think what they recommend on the inside here is um, I don't I don't want to I don't want to say this without knowing for sure, but I think it's ethylene glycol. Um, so yeah. And, you know, if you, put, if you put like a pyrethroid in there or maybe even the mineral oil, I don't know, it, 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 it could um, maybe repel them. So anyway, the, these are useful. Of course, they don't work. If you're using these, you need to take the bed skirt off. You need to pull the bed away from the wall. And I've even heard of people doing all that stuff, but the bed bugs climb up the wall up to the ceiling and then just drop. So... There's that same data. Okay, the, the canine inspections, we already talked about this. Here's what the dog might look like. thing to remember about these dogs is they're not pets, you know. So when I saw one of these in action, the way they keep them trained is the only time they're able to feed is if they signal on a live bed bug. So the, the, the you know, operator, he carries a little belt right here full of food. And that's why they do this every day, so the dog can eat. Um, the dog signals on something, he gives him food. And the dog goes to the next one, signals, he gets food again. You don't think they're smart enough to thank it? <laughs> no, I don't. They just do that, they eat. Well, I, I mean, the, the guy knows where he's set live bed bugs and viable eggs. So if he incorrectly signals on something, they're not going to be, you know, reinforced. Right, so, and these are definitely not pets, you know. You know, I'm a, I have a couple dogs... You know, I can't be there hugging my dog and kissing my dog, you know. Like, these are tools. And so they, they keep them in the crate when they're not in use, and they're only fed when they, when they you know, detect live bed bugs or viable eggs. And in reality, that might seem cruel, but I mean, this is, giving a dog a job is the greatest thing you can do, right? Even if it's in a crate the other half of the time, that's more exercise and more mental stimulation than most dogs yet. Yeah. Right, yeah, and they're, you know, they can train these things for termites, for cockroaches, all these different things. Um, but like I said, they're ten to fifteen thousand bucks, so a little bit of an investment, and definitely you need one person. Like that dog needs its trainer to, you know. So you hire the people as a unit. You don't just send any technician out with the dog. It has to be the person who's been trained. Okay, these are pretty neat. They're, they're fairly new. They might be kind of hard to find, but I'm pretty sure you can order these from the company. And these are um, they're, they're units that have carbon dioxide. They also have chiromones, which are emitted, and then heat. So what, what are these? These are designed to mimic a person, basically. And they give a puff of CO2 every five seconds to simulate an exhalation. And, and it's heated up. 
So th- those pheromones or, or chiromones in there are emitted too. And th- these aren't meant for control, but they're used for monitoring devices. And, and they think that right now the best use for these is in vacant rooms. So in a school at night, the room that might be infested is vacant. So you put one of these in the middle of the room, and those bed bugs are going to be drawn to it. And then they, you know, they get captured down here, and they walk through a hole in this one and get captured. But this might be, a, if there's a room you suspect has bed bugs, but you didn't pick any up on your visual inspection, you might have a couple of these floating around the district to put in a room at night to see if you pick anything up. How much? This one's about 450 This one's about 1000 And my personal recommendation is not to try to take this through airport security. <laughs> You're not going to make it too far. You'll probably get shot. So, um, yeah, anyway... These are those, not meant, they're only meant for monitoring, especially in vacant rooms. Or in a hotel setting, you know, you want to get the person out of the room as quickly as possible. Um, but if you leave that room vacant, bed bugs might migrate to the other rooms to find a host. If you put this in there, it might keep them from migrating. Um, these are expensive, and I think these little canisters, they last for 10 hours, so one night of monitoring. So you have to keep buying new CO2 cylinders and lures. Um, Clutter removal. This is very important. Obviously, the, the more your environment can be simplified, the easier it is to inspect and control. So, storing things under a bed is a very bad idea if you think you have bed bugs. Get rid of everything from underneath the bed. That's endless spots for things to hide. Um, so, remove clutter. If you try to do a treatment in a room like that, you're going to fail. Straight up. Um, dis- dis- disposing things. You know, there's no level of success with disposing infested items. If things are really heavily infested, or maybe you have a complex piece of furniture that can't be treated easily, then you might dispose of it. But you don't just take it out to the sidewalk and throw it on the ground. Um, What you want to do first is treat it with an insecticide and maybe bag it. So as you're removing it from the building, you're not dropping bed bugs as you go. So you might do that. And then what you also want to do is destroy these things. You know, somebody walking along might say, hey, that's a nice couch. Pick it up, take bed bugs home. Um, but if you, you know, take a knife or a box cutter and slash it to pieces, nobody's going to want that, I think. Although in college I might have wanted it, so. <laughs> it just depends. Um, yeah. Or, or you definitely write on there bed bugs. That might deter people. <laughs> yeah, if you don't like your neighbor as well, go here, make sure it's a nice Hotel King mattress, nice and new. Okay, isolating things in containers, especially if you've treated these on a hot wash and a hot dry heat cycle. You know, these things are bed bug free. So you can put them in these airtight containers and keep bed bugs out of, out of, out of these items. That's a really good thing to do. Again, simplifying the environment. Vaseline, um, some people, since this stuff is fairly cheap, they want to put this around the legs of the bed. Um, you know, they, they do see bed bugs sticking in the Vaseline. Um, but what we don't know is which direction they're coming from. We don't know if some made it all the way through or not. So Vaseline's not recommended. If you're going to do this, you might as well use the climb up interceptors. They're more effective. Um, again, simplification, moving to metal or maybe even glass furniture, very, something very modern. The hotels did not like this idea, nor did they like my, my idea of eliminating headboards and having an artist paint one on the, on the wall. I thought it was a good idea, but... Anyway, so metal furniture is pretty good in general. It's simplified. It's pretty slick, so they have trouble climbing. The the one downside to metal is maybe you don't like the look of it. But if there are any screw holes or, you know, hollow legs and things, if bed bugs can get inside the furniture, they can, you know, start reproducing in there. So if you buy metal furniture, make sure it's sealed. Um, Cleaning solutions, you know, if you directly rub the eggs and directly rub the bed bugs and things, you might kill them. But this isn't guaranteed kill. The one benefit of scrubbing things with soap and water is that if there is fecal material and shed skins on there, you're going to wipe all that off. So next time you go back to do an inspection, if you see new stuff, you know it's recent. So that's really the benefit of washing, which isn't that much of a benefit. Um, laundry. This is, prob- this is something that every IPM, bed bug IPM program should have. Is, is At the least, you don't necessarily have to wash this on high heat but you definitely have to dry it on high heat. So you put it in there for 30 minutes on high heat, and that should take care of all life stages of the bed bug. Um, so 
that's something, and it's, you have, if you have a big industrial dryer in the district, then that could be used for that. Okay, and, and if you do want to wash things, or if you want to minimize transporting things around and dispersing bed bugs, go with the dissolvable bags, throw it right into the washer, and that way you're not going to spread anything around. And dry heat is better than moist heat, so keep that in mind. Steaming. Steaming is, a lot of people use steaming. It's very effective, and essentially you're boiling the eggs and boiling the different life stages. Um, it can be a little bit time-consuming because you can only go one, one linear foot per 20 seconds. So when you're steaming, you're pretty much going like this. So you can imagine how long that takes to steam clean you know, everything in the room. So maybe you just focus it on the mattresses or something like that. The other thing is, is that if the steam is somewhat pressurized, if you have a bunch of bed bugs and you just go willy-nilly on it, it can blow the bed bugs away. And so you spread bed bugs around. <laughs> so what a lot of people are doing is they're putting a, some type of cloth around the outside of the steamer to kind of make sure that it doesn't come out with force. Um, but this is an option. It's you know, chemical free, obviously, that's a plus. But it is time consuming. But it will kill 100% of the life stages if you expose them to heat long enough. The downside also is poor penetration of heat. So, you know, you're treating the surface of these things, but you're not getting into them at all. So, just another good thing to add. So, how long on exposure for steam? Like I said, one, 20 seconds per linear foot. So, slow. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's instant. I mean, it, it, you know, it has to build up the heat. And so, if you just went like that, it wouldn't kill them. You know, you have, it has to be exposed at a certain time frame, which that's the only stat that I personally have on that. Again, another thing to add. Here are these mattress encasements. Um, there are about two brands right now that, that are recommended for use. They've been tested to, to keep bed bugs inside the mattress. And, the, and, the, and they also will not let the bed bugs feed through, the, through that material. So basically, you're capturing the bed bugs inside. You leave these encasements on long enough to kill the bed bugs. So for at least a year, you're keeping these encasements on. You buy high quality encasements, yeah. So if you buy a cheap one, which might be like the things you put on your bed when you were a kid, for instance, um, you know, they, maybe they will stop feeding. Um, but, but the really good ones, they're almost like cotton-like material. And for some reason, their pro bosses can't fit through there. However, the, the fabric is woven. Yeah, I, I don't know the technology behind it. But yeah, they, they can't get their feeding parts through there. Um, but where, and if you buy a cheap one, you know, it, it might work to some degree, but they tend to break down faster. You know, if you need it on there for a year, that, that cover has to last a year. Um, but, but the good ones are nice and soft. I mean, there's no reason not to have them on. They're not going to be crunchy. You don't have to be embarrassed, you know. Um, but uh, where a lot of these things fail are, are the zippers. And they fail in a couple of ways. Either the zipper teeth are too large. So that first instar nymph can just climb right through the teeth of the zipper, or where the zipper ends. So this one has a nice hook, you know, that's kind of gives you peace of mind. But look right there. Pretty much every stage of a bed bug can fit through that hole. So really you're just creating a nice home for them. So you have to make sure that, that these things have some, tor some type of structure at the end that really makes sure that zipper is sealing the bugs inside. And protect the bed and active guard are the two mattress encasements that they're recommending right now. Scientifically proven to keep bed bugs in. Okay, somebody had asked about cold. They have this new thing they developed in Europe called cryonite, and it freezes to minus, I don't know, 190 something or another. Um, but anyway, th this works really rapidly to, to kill all the life stages of insects. If, if you chill down insects gradually, they just adapt to it. And we don't actually have a lower you know, thermal threshold for death. You know, there, there aren't any good numbers. Say if you wanted to throw something in the freezer, we don't really know yet, you know, time versus temperature, what, what will kill bed bugs. Um, this will definitely kill bed bugs if it comes in contact with them. But again, just like the steam, there isn't good penetration of that temperature through materials. And then somebody mentioned uh, this dry ice. You know, it doesn't work on a whole room level, obviously. But if you had a small container and you had some items in there and you put a block of dry ice in there, then maybe you would kill those bed bugs. But dry ice is, well, I've actually never purchased dry ice, but I hear it's somewhat expensive if you had to use it on a regular basis. So th this is not recommended. 
this might be just another tool in, in the toolbox. So, vacuuming. You know, if you have a if you have a huge bed bug population, vacuums can suck bed bugs up pretty quickly. You can eliminate you know, over 90% of the bugs right there and then. Uh, the problem with bed bug with vacuuming bed bugs is that you run the risk of transferring things around to other rooms when you go to vacuum other rooms. So, but what they're recommending is that you use a vacuum with a HEPA filter type of thing, and then either in the bag you put some of that diatomaceous earth or a, or a silicate, a dust. You put a dust in the bag, so when they're sucked in, they'll get killed by the dust. Or when you're done vacuuming, you, know, you put a pile of diatomaceous earth on the floor and you vacuum it up. Either way, you're trying to kill the bugs inside the vacuum. And as soon as you're done, you take the bag out, you bag it up, and you toss it. You know, don't want to spread those around the vacuum. Um, <clears throat> here, here are those propane heaters I was talking about. Again, these things crank out the heat. You know, they, they, they can heat a room to you know, about 150 degrees. Um, the guy I was telling you about, pretty interesting. He, he thought originally that the heat would disperse the bed bugs, you know, because it, it tends to repel cockroaches and other insects. But for bed bugs, since they're attracted to body heat, um, until it reaches 110 degrees, they actually come out of hiding and, try, and congregate near where these heat sources are coming out. And so if the temperature can rise quickly enough above 113, um, it actually starts to immobilize the bed bugs to keep them from running away, and then they're exposed to the heat. So I think that's pretty neat. Things that don't work, turning the heat up in the house does not work. Turning the, turning the air conditioner on does not work. Um, in fact, if you turn the temperature down, it'll just be prolonging the bed bug's life cycle. Um, putting things in black plastic and setting them out in the sun, that does not work. You know, maybe it might re reach a lethal temperature on the side that's facing the direct sunlight. But anywhere else in the bag, it doesn't get above 100 degrees. They, they tested it. So these things are not going to work. Okay, finally, I'm getting to the insecticides. Um, you know, there are these things. This is called Sterifab. You can apply that directly to mattresses. Um, on this one, effectiveness equals thoroughness. So if you see the bugs and you see the eggs and you can directly apply the chemical to them, it'll work. Other than that, it doesn't have a residual property. Permethrin and permethrin and beta cyfluthrin, these are both pyrethroid insecticides. So they have demonstrated resistance to both of these products. Um, in one study, they, they had 95% control um, in a room that had a lot of clutter, mind you. Um, mixing beta cyfluthrin with delta methrin, which is another pyrethroid, and hydroprene, um, which is an insect growth regulator. So they did get 95% control with that. So maybe that's an option. Um, again, here's delta methrin, lambda, cyhalothrin. You know, maybe this product has a residual, but it's not to say you know, bed bugs might be repelled by that residual, or they might walk over it, or whatever. So again, these pyrethroids may or may not be effective. Um, what one of the few alternatives we have to pyrethroids is this chemical class here called, uh, well, they're in the pyroli family, but chlor chlorphenopyr is the active ingredient in this product called Phantom. Um, and they're using this fairly successfully. It does have a fairly long residual period of maybe more than a week. Um, so this is an, an alternative. Also, it will kill eggs. So that, that no restricted products? Ooh. I'm guessing this one is. Uh -huh. The other ones, I don't. Yep, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say. Um, you just have to check. When you go to buy these things, say, you know, are they restricted use or not? Yeah. I mean, from what I've heard, decent results from this and decent results from Suspend SC. The publication says not very good results from Suspend SC, so I don't know. And in the other one, the Lambda Cyhalothrin, I think that was demand or something. What was that? Yeah, demand G, I, I guess that publication says they're getting decent control with that. So, I mean, d different populations of bed bugs around the country, they're going to have different levels of resistance to these things. So maybe you have a population that, you know, will still be killed by pyrethroids or are more susceptible than other populations. Okay. Um, so here are the, these dusts, the silica with the pyrethrins, diatomaceous earth, limestone. So these have been used pretty effectively in control programs. Um, this limestone, you know, they actually polled uh, pest management professionals from around the country to see what they were using. That's where this information came from. 
Um, you know, limestone, not very effective. Boric acid, you might think that works well. It does have some desiccation effect on insects, but the main mode of action for boric acid is as a stomach poison. So effective on things like cockroaches, not recommended for bed bugs. So don't, don't use boric acid. Instead, use a silicate or a diatomaceous earth. Um, insect growth regulators, there's not a lot of good data on these yet to show that they do, do work. Um, this hydroprene, that was the one that was mixed with the, what was it, delta methrin and the uh, beta siphon? Well, I mentioned earlier. It was mixed with a couple things. Um, you know, they, they can't say for sure if this is helping, but maybe they keep nymphs from molting. Maybe they keep the nymphs from reading a, reaching adulthood. Uh, maybe they have some effect on the fertility of the adult females. So there might be some effect going on there. But no good evidence to back it up that this stuff alone is going to get the job done. And finally, if you do want 100% control of bed bugs, uh, fumigation will do that. Very expensive. Um, there, there was a multifamily dwelling in New York. Had over 200 rooms with three towers. And the infestation was so great, they said, we're going to fumigate this thing. So they tented that whole building for about $250,000. They fumigated it. So well, only one person had to have brought bed bugs with them when they left, and that, that will return them to that, that structure you know, for that treatment to fail. So, but if it comes down to it, if the population gets too big, you might have to fumigate. Um, and then, again, as I mentioned, on a small scale, maybe inside a, a closed container or a garbage bag, you might be able to use these pest strips as a mini fumigation. But again, follow the label. Um, these kind of green products are regarded as safe products. Um, essential oils, there's no data to, to say that these work or not. So, not sure about them. If you want to try them out, go ahead. Okay, and then as I mentioned before, the chemical companies, they're still catching up with, with new chemistries. Um, not that these are new chemistries, but they're, they're looking to get um, these chemistries re registered for bed bugs indoor. So acetamiprid, th these are neonicotinoids, the acetamiprid, imidacloprid, dinotefuran. Um, so these are all things you might be seeing on the market fairly soon. And I mentioned mode of action before and insect resistance. If they're resistant to DDT and pyrethroids, they're probably not resistant to the neonicotinoids. So if you hit them with a different chemical class altogether, in this case, case it's uh, mode of action group four, um, there's a good chance you'll take out a lot of the population. But if you keep using neonicotinoids over and over and over again, eventually resistance is going to build up to those chemicals. So you've got to be careful. Um, and then there's this one down here. It's a carbamate insecticide, which is a mode of action group one, um, so different from these other, other ones, called uh, propoxyr. Maybe you've heard of this in the, in the news. Um, it's been legalized in other countries for use uh, for bed bug control. Um, Twelve states here tried to band together and get the EPA to allow it for use on you know, mattresses and, and things like that for bed bug control. Um, but it's been shown to have negative effect on, on child, you know, child health and development. So still, EPA is not allowing this stuff. Yep, they, they have those in some flea collars, propoxyr. And additionally, th there is one product, I guess, that you can use indoors that has propoxyr in it. You, just, you can't use it on mattresses. You can use it along baseboards, apparently. And yeah, Richard Beard just told me that. I don't know what the product is called. I have to look it up. But um, I guess to some degree you can use this chemical I indoors. But definitely read the label to make sure. Okay. Here are the things that are most commonly used. You can see again, both of them are, most of them are pyrethroids. Here's that chlorphenopyr. That's a different group. Anyway, um, and one last thing about insecticides, as I mentioned earlier, use multiple formulations. So use dusts, use liquids, and use the aerosols. Come at them from many different angles. If you just use liquid or just use any one of these, you're probably not going to get good control.